What's going on guys? I'm just the day is Halloween, uh, the 31st of October. Let me make sure if everyone can hear me okay. If you can hear me, give me a, a, a thumbs up or in the chat. Let me know. All right, so here we go. Today it should be a, a pretty quick uh, webinar. Um, I want to give you guys some insights in terms of what's happening uh, in terms of the general market, LPC, LBS, and also some activities that are happening over the next few days or so um, with uh, our partners and the institutions with which with whom we have some affiliations. And I like to generally talk about some of the issues that have been happening lately with the uh, hosting some hosting services um, and some recent hacks and want to be able to address some of those um, as well so once again just general stats activities and then moving on to discuss some of the issues associated with the um, the master node shared services so with that said um, we're going to move into general statistics look at coin market cap total market cap of 202 billion dollars um, we're still maintaining a uh, well over a little bit over two billion over the 200 200 billion um, BTC is down just ever so slightly um, for the most part the market is down you look at it overall now some of you have been asking hey when is the uh, when is the bear market coming when excuse me when is the bull market coming when are we going to have that bull run of 2018 we've been looking for the bull run of 2018 since like the beginning of the year <laughs> ever since there was a, a pullback um but you know we it happens in cycles guys so i'd like to bit today to just go over briefly after talking about lpc and LGS briefly what we can expect in terms of when is the bull bull run happening we'll look at past bull runs we'll look at the, the complete cycle from the the run up to the run down to the accumulation and then the subsequent run up so it makes the horns of the, the bull so to speak so let's as we talked about earlier BTC is about six six thousand three hundred dollars I'm um, down about 0.23 percent uh, moving over into LPC um, we're at a nominal coin price of 61 cents uh, down today about 5 percent but up about 10 percent uh, week over week um, if you compared it to to last week um, market cap of around 2.2.3 um, million dollars um, volume is around 61k uh, for the most part, we were under under two million, but it kicked up uh, a, a bit this week. Um, I think we're in a good position considering that we're still in what's considered as a bear market. Some people are saying that we're in an accumulation phase. I would tend to agree with that particular notion. Um, ROI is 144 days to uh, a full um, master node or return on investment, uh, active master nodes, uh, 2500, over 2500, um, 2,566. I think the accumulation of master nodes is, is quite um, good. At the same time, it helps to protect the network, send instant transactions, send anonymous transactions, and once again, it just pre prevents us from being hacked. And I think that's a, a, a good thing at the end of the day, particularly when we begin to think about how we are configuring the, the payment network for the point of sale devices and the um, onboarding logistics companies who will be using our platform to track and trace and for individuals who will be using the application to track and trace. Um, we will have the capabilities to be able to, to post those transactions on our own LGS blockchain when you think about uh, the um, supply chain application. Um, everything from provenance, um, where a product is created, all the way through um, to uh, when it's delivered, when it reaches a certain location. But that's on L LGS, but let me finish up on LPC. For the most part, um, master note worth is $611, almost 0.1 BTC. Um, we're beginning to see, um, and from here, just doing a, 
a, a quick analysis here. We've trended down, but yet it looks like we flattened out, and now it is slowly but surely a curve up, curve curve upwards here. If we just begin to try, trace the price action over the, the past month or so, we've been in an accumulation phase, and now it looks like it's beginning to trend upwards, moving more towards. Yesterday it was 66 cents. Um, today it's, it's around 61 cents. Let's see how it moves over the next few days. Look at the master node growth, still positive and upwards, um, monotonically increasing. It's still going in a positive direction and still going upwards. So it, 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 at this point in time, guys, considering where we've been ever since the beginning of, of June and this moving forward, I think we, we've been making great progress. We have over half the master nodes of, of Dash at this point, one of the most popular um, master nodes in all over the world at this point, the uh, the granddaddy of them all, but it's in a position now where we're in striking distance of becoming one of the top or having one of the highest master nodes in all of the master node space. Um, I think we're in the maybe the top 10 or top 20 um, at this point. We can quickly find that out now. Quickly go back here, sort by nodes. Uh, the number number of nodes here, zero here. Right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so right now we're in the eleventh place in terms of all of the master nodes. Um, you have Smart Cash, Horizon, Secure Node, um, Telios, Patcoin, Dash, which is at four thousand nine four thousand nine hundred. But we're we're half we're over halfway there, guys. If we can get to five thousand, I think that's a reasonable amount of nodes to be able to support all of our customers and and consumers in in the Light Paycoin network. And I think we need to be able to do the same thing with Lotus Coin as well. Okay, that's all I'll discuss on. Excuse me here. Exit out on Lotus and moving to Lotus Coin. Uh, we have a nominal price of three dollars and twenty-five cents, up ten percent day over from yesterday, with a market cap of about two uh, two million, with a volume of about one hundred thirty-seven thousand, a little un, a little over five percent of the volume is trading relative to the, the market cap. The nominal price has been taking a, a hit. We can ex we can give various reasons why. One could say, hey, you no, know, the market is generally down. You could also say, hey, it was a recent hack on um, a master node, um, a shared master node service. At the same time, one could attribute it as well to the increase in the payouts to the uh, payout to the master node owners because we've had increases in the payout there would need to be a corresponding demand on the buy side to keep the price action stable but to the degree that you have more su more supply than you do demand then you're going to see a decrease in the price until there's an equilibrium so we would need some corresponding demand on the uh, on on the buy side in order to keep up with the increases in the master nodes an increase in the the price action to be equivalent um, and balance those things out with LPS. We've already, excuse me, with LPC, we've already gone through that phase, whereby we've had a, a run up and increase in the payouts to the master node owners. Now we're in, we're we're descending in terms of the payouts to the master node owners, and as a consequence, right now we have a we had a balance in terms of the demand for um, LPC um, and the supply. Now that it's actually decreasing there's going to be fewer and fewer coins on the market creating that perception of scarcity and to the extent that demand stays the same you're going to see an increase in the price action but we see some some slight evidence of that over this the past few days where we've seen slight increases in the price uh, so to the degree that we have um, more and more decreases in the, um, the payouts to the master node owners it's going to put it in a position where um, it's going to and demand stays the same is going to increase the, increase the price action but at the same time we have to look at what the general market is doing so let's take a brief a, a brief skip over to and just let me finish up on LGS first here um, my mind is running today because I want to get through a lot of things um, ROI 60 days um, number of master nodes 462 
Um, coins locked up 72%. That's that's great. Master note worth is about half of BTC. Um, as you can see, it's going through its the general phase in the down market. There's an initial run up. Then there's a a, a pullback and a, a bear market that kicks in for this particular coin uh, at the this level. And at the same time, we see an increase in the number of master nodes. It's not decreasing. So everyone who has a perception, oh, well, people are dropping the project. Well, no one's leaving the project as evidenced by the um, the still monotonically increasing number of master nodes being added day over day. So that's the general trend that's still in place. And if, even if people are selling, other people are buying. So it's balancing out. So I, I think at the end of the day, we're we're in a good position. And at the same time, I have some announcements related to LGS specifically uh, in terms of our partnerships. So. Um, with that said, I'm going to go back to the original issues around the, the general market and some of you asking the question, okay, when are we going to get out of this market? When are we going to get out of this bear trend or start the accumulation phase? And when, when, when are we going to begin to push into the bull run? Um, and I would just want to admit up front now, I am not by any means a, a, a high speed, low drag expert TA guy. But I've done just a little bit of work to just look at the, the, the trends we have going on. So just looking at the total market in terms of what's happening, we see here, if we were to move to the, the three-month period, and we've been pretty much moving sideways. Um, the lows are getting slightly higher. As you can see here, here's the low, and this goes all the way back to September the 12th, and we're getting ready to end up in November tomorrow. So 188 billion in market cap on the pullback, 192. I wouldn't necessarily count this as 208, but then when you drop back down here, it's 201. So I'm looking at the dip here, the dip here, the dip here, which is at two, roughly 201, 202. And then the most recent dip here, which is around 200, 202, 203. So you're seeing over the past month, really month, month and a half, you're seeing lower, excuse me, higher lows here, 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 and here. But at the same time, which is on the, looking at it from the, the bearish perspective, and that was a bullish perspective where you're seeing higher, higher and higher lows over the past month. But if you look back out here over this time span, we still have lower highs. Not as aggressive in the, the swings up to the, the, the high side, but now we have lower highs, but those lower um, highs are not getting much lower. It looks like it's going relatively flat. And if you understand the, the trends around bear markets, bull markets, um, you can see, get some evidence of what's likely to happen. So what I did here is I got an account on TradingView just to look at what were the trends over the past, um, say, five, six years or so around BTC, um, because this is the, the, the majority of the market when we're looking at looking at cryptocurrencies in general, um, Bitcoin has the highest um, highest market cap. So it's somewhat like the leader happening in place. So if we can take a look here, and this is what I was able to map out over this past, over the past few weeks or so, and this is the daily chart coming off, coming off of Bitfinex. We see the lower lows, and excuse me, we see the um, lower highs. They're getting lower and lower and lower. Um, and then at the same time, we're seeing higher lows starting once again. We can even go back to aspects of June, June 24th on the, the Bitfinex exchange. And here, higher lows, higher lows here. So, and we actually broke through. And, and as some, some people will argue, this was the FUD that was created by the, the USB Tether. Um, and saying that they were having issues with Tether and it was a, a breakthrough, but it maintained to some extent out of the wedge. If you can look at the wedge here and you can see the um, this descending wedge where we have the top part of the wedge going down and the lower part of the wedge, actually you see no information here. But what I'll do is I'm going to span out over an extended period of time so you can see 
where I drew the, the, the beginning part of the wedge. The starting part of the lower wedge goes all the way back to March of 2017. And you have a point here, you have a point here in, say, July 18. And you have another point here where you have that wedge action, the, the lower part of the wedge coming through. And now this lower part of the wedge is, of my opinion, once again, don't take this as professional advice. This is edge for educational purposes only. You see this lower part of the wedge, if it breaks through, we may have some more downward action, but I'm of the opinion, looking at it here, uh, let's go back, going all the way back to March, that this is the the trend that it's going it's going to catch this lower part of this descending wedge and ride it through that's just my opinion because I, I think we're in the accumulation phase at this point um, and that's just my opinion because we're not seeing aggressive lower highs but we are seeing some we are seeing some higher lows on those pullbacks and as a result I if it bounces up and it catches this lower wedge I think we could be in a position of moving into a, a more the bull season but what evidence do I have to suggest um, like what happens during the bull season and just let's just look at some of the prior um, prior actions this is going all the way back to November 2013 where we had there was a bull run and then there was a, a bear a bear run and then it went into a, a, an accumulation phase here and started its upward trend from peak to peak. And I want to go back and show the peak. And that was in, this was in like December on Bitfinex. But at the same time, going back another, another full cycle from peak to peak. So peak to peak, we see that there was a, a bear run, an accumulation, bull bear run then I see accumulation bull and what I mean by bull just the bull run but then coming here you see the, the bull run the bear phase and stretching this out and this is what I, I feel we're in an accumulation at this point how long this lasts um, I'm not certain but I'll, I'll keep you guys updated in terms of what's happening uh, with the price action uh, over this time period. So I look to give a little bit more detail. And looking at the RSI, it's it looks like it's oversold. So it looks like there's going to be a push up over these next few days. How far it goes, does it break up to the upside and catch this part of this lower wedge, which is actually standing out here. But guys, I, I think we're in a position we may see some some action here considering where this RSI is. Let me take a quick pause to see if there are questions. Mm, uh, hey, Dr. D, Scott Vanderpool. Hey, folks, right up on the meeting you've attended. Um, sound is great. Um, what role will the Masinos have with POS and ATMs? Will it earn rewards? How will the Masinos be selected by the uh, point of sale device and the ATMs. Okay, so this is Joe in crypto. Thanks for your question. And there are there are a couple of business models that we which we are actually have in place to experiment on because it's going into the pilot phase. We won't actually know what we stay what model we stick with at the end of the day because it's going to take some fast experimentation and iteration. And I'll explain uh, on the ATMs first, if it makes sense there. With the ATM machines, um, where you would be able to insert fiat and then make a purchase of cryptocurrency. Here, there are a couple things you have to consider from the perspective of a merchant who's actually owning the ATM machine. If you have BTC in that particular wallet linked to that ATM machine, you would have to fill that wallet with BTC, in, or in our case, LPC or LGS, or, or any other coins that are on that particular wallet. Because you have to make the purchase of that cryptocurrency, then insert it into that wallet to be available for anyone purchasing through that ATM, 
Um, that's money that you have to spend in order to acquire the asset to make it available for purchase on that ATM. And some ATMs, they have the avail have the option of where it will give you uh, an email alert saying, hey, your balance is low on your BTC, or your balance is low on your LPC or LGS in our, our, our scenario. Um, it will be at the point with uh, the master nodes, we are linking the ATM to the master node. So you're going to have an ATM that's linked to a wallet. And that wallet is linked to a master node. So just imagine this scenario here. Not, I should not necessarily go into detail on it because it could give some evidence of you know, how we're building out our infrastructure. So let me say this: the master node will be able to fund the ATM, the ATM machine. So now think about it. If we have any master node owners in the audience now um, listening, your wallet, say for instance, sitting either on your your computer or on your um, in a VPS that you have linked to a master node that may also be sitting in a VPS. Not it's not necessarily the case that your your wallet has to sit in in, in the cloud. It can be on your desktop, um, but it, it's the case that the master node linked to that wallet will pay out to that particular wallet. Now there's an application that will run in the background to say, okay, what are the balances on the respective coins in the ATM? If it's the case we're low on LGS and if the LGS master node or LGS is linked to the master node, it could be the case the LPC wallet could manage it where there are coins sitting in that wallet where there would need to be an amount sent to or LGS. It can reach out to an exchange, make us a, a a, a, a swap or or a exchange of LPC to LGS and the LGS could be sent to that particular wallet to fill the balance to support the transactions. Um, at the same time, there's another implementation through BlockNet whereby the BlockNet application has the capability of cross uh, cross chain atomic swaps. So with cross-chain atomic swaps, you can go directly from LPC to BTC or from LPC to LGS and then be able to fund the wallet. Excuse me, you fund the wallet linked to the ATM machine. Now, thinking about it from that perspective, you no longer have to replenish the, the wallet to the degree that you have a sufficient number of master nodes linked to the uh, ATM that's linked to the wallet. At the same time, you can be competitive in the sense where you don't have to charge any fees for the, the, the point of sale, excuse me, the ATM in making the transactions. I know some, some owners would, may perhaps want to optimize the revenue, but our recommendation is that you lower the fees associated with the purchase of the cryptocurrency. Same thing with the, the point of sale device. Similar infrastructure in the sense that there's a wallet linked to the device as well that's able to, re to receive the cryptocurrency payments made by the uh, made by the consumer in say a grocery store or a barbershop, a beauty salon, or any other um, mom and pop um, organization. So that's how the infrastructure that the way we planned it, the business model around that is the way in which you generate the revenue is one you're having people or consumers purchase the cryptocurrency from your ATM which is the source of revenue for, for you. And in addition to that, the ATM is actually receiving currency from the master node payment. So you have to think a portion of it could be dedicated to replenishing the master node, either making the cross-chain atomic swap, the BTC, LT, um, LGS, or even the LPC um, in terms of balance short shortages on the ATM. But it's at the point where it should maintain itself and if you have a sufficient number of master nodes to uh, receive those payments. So let me see if that makes sense. Whoa, my, we got a lot of questions here. Uh, you mentioned that there are a lot of institutional investors buying large quantities of LPC through OTC trade. How does OTC trade impact the market value of LPC? Um, looking at, and, and what I was mentioning earlier, we have, and this is happening in the general market, and we've had calls ourselves in handling OTC uh, OTC transactions of, of individuals making inquiries. How can they make these uh, large purchases? Um, how does it impact the market value of LPC? Now I can move at the general um, market level 
uh, when we're talking about the cryptocurrency market overall. As you've noticed over the past month or so, over the past month or so, we've had very little volatility. Um, the volatility is such where it's very, very small and people are getting bored. They say, hey, there's no price action up or down. The day traders are losing their absolute minds because there's no volatility at this point. Why is there no volatility? Um, there's several hypotheses as to why that's happening. One is where a lot of the volume is not happening on the retail exchanges. So when you think about, say, the top 50 or even all of the exchanges um, that are listed on coin market cap, it's the case that some of these exchanges now have um, OTC trading desks. Because they have OTC trading desks, then they're, they are available to institutions. So if you contact a Coinbase, if you contact a Kraken, they do have these um, institutional accounts where they can handle these over-the-counter transactions. So you're seeing large purchases of BTC, large purchases of Ethereum, um, Litecoin, and the other top coins, very large purchases. Because that volume is not reflected in the retail volume that you see on, on CoinMarketCap, you're not seeing drastic movements up or downwards. For instance, think about a scenario where someone wanted to purchase, say, $10 million worth of worth of Bitcoin at the current spot price. If they were to go on to, say, let, let's use Kraken, for example. If they were to go on to Kraken, and then they made the transfer from um, a, a wire transfer from their bank account to a Kraken account, and now make that purchase of BTC, what are you going to see in terms of the volume on that particular exchange? You're going to see it shoot through the roof. That may hurt other buyers coming in at the same other OTC buyers coming in because they wanted the price at the $6,300 for BTC. I know from the retail perspective, we say, hey, it's the case. We're not seeing that, that volume or seeing that price action being reflected um, because that that's OTC that's an OTC trans transaction so over the counter transaction so it's making the price only what you see on the exchanges and coin market cap flat that's why you're not seeing this volatility despite the all of the great news that's coming out infrastructure being built backed exchange coming out in November the SEC decision on the ETS um, you have one coming up in November and another one actually in uh, December as well. So all of this great news, um, more adoption coming on from the big in the big players in the game, educational institutions investing into cryptocurrencies. You know, you're seeing some of the top schools like uh, Yale, um, their endowments, they're taking part portions of their endowments and they're pouring it into cryptocurrency. All of this great news, but yet we see no no upward price action um, because these are institutional investors making OTC over the counter transactions. The, the price would swing drastically if that's the case. So the institutional investors are getting large amounts uh, and accumulating cryptocurrency through over the counter transaction at the spot price reflected on retail transactions, if that makes sense. So that's currently what's happening in this space. Hmm. Uh, let me see. Do you have any plans to update the LPC website? Yes, that's happening. We've already formed a committee in um, uh, updating the website, um, and that will um, and we'll keep you guys up to date. I'm not taking the lead on that. Um, it's the case that there's already like scripts written out. There's seen, and from what I understand, template builds of what the new site will look like. But I'll keep you up to date. I'll touch base with the council and guys who are moving out on that as well. Uh, press release recaps conferences, meetings, and sneak peeks of the developments at UCF. Okay, like music to your ears, I'm going to give you a quick update on UCF in a minute um, on a variety of different fronts, and I think you'll be um, somewhat excited. Uh, the market is a cycle, so what the services that people will spend LBC, LG, just coins in. I mean, the network won't survive only by creating new coins on the network and having new investors buy nodes. Um, so for the most part, that was from XXDAMD Power XX. 
understand your question. Yes, we do do need to have some consumer transactions. We need to have B2B transactions and B2C transactions. That's the way that we're looking to increase the the not only the volume that we have in being um, exchanged or paid for um, LPC or LGS, but that consumer, that mass adoption that we need to take place at the consumer level, peer-to-peer, um, -peer, and also at, from the institution to consumer, that's B2C, and also from institution to institution, that's the, the B2B. So at the B2B level, we're Right now, with our partners in Lumina, they are on the verge of, of making a lot of announcements. I'm not going to make any of their announcements for them. They're pushing their announcements, and then as soon as their announcements come out, we're going to make the announcement, push it to the community so everyone knows. Um, those transactions that will happen with LPC will be with um, a, a business to another business, Lumina to another business. So that's a B2B transaction. and with that, I would anticipate large, large volume of LPC being exchanged or being um, sent over the network. At the same time, with the point of sale devices, and, and that work is happening both with LPC and LGS at the B2B level. At the B2C level, the, our strategy is actually being having both the ATMs and the point of sale devices available for businesses. If you have a, a an ATM in your business or a point of sale device in your business, you're getting B to C volume in the sense that you're purchasing a consumer goes into a, a, a business or a merchant, purchase a product, goods or services, and actually pays in LPC or LGS. That is the option of driving volume from a B to B to C level. Also with the ATM as well, if to the degree that the merchant owns the ATM, they can actually replenish if to the degree that is supported by the master node the master node so replenishes the ATM in terms of the coins that are available for purchase and at the same time consumers are inserting fiat into the um, device and they're receiving revenue that way and supported by a master node with low fees same thing with the point of sale device in terms of how it's supported in, in the infrastructure where there's a, a wallet linked to a master node the master node pays the wallet wallet allocates to the um, the ATM and if there are refunds that are happening in this, this, at the service desk of a, a merchant, then some of those refunds can take place out of that POS device. At the same time, B at the P, P2P level or C2C or consumer to consumer level, and that's just peer to peer transactions. So if anyone is interested in, in buying goods and services from each other, making those swaps, um, then they can engage and buy and sell in LPC. So those are the ways in which we're looking to increase that volume at the the peer-to-peer -peer level, which is primarily driven by individuals. Hey, you're playing a game of, uh, of you're playing a game of golf, and basically, depending on how many rounds. I'm not a golf player, but say you're wagering bits and amounts. Let's go to card games. If you're at so some guys get together and playing a poker game, hey, it's the case you can trade out an LPC. I think that's a, a popular way in which you can actually get it done without exchanging any currency or even pulling out any fiat currency as well. That's at the peer-to-peer the -peer level. B2C, once again, buying goods and services within a store, a LPC or LGS, um, supported by master those point of sale and ATM machines. And then there are corporate institutions that are engaging in business with other businesses using LPC and LGS. Um, right now, there are actions taking place with our our institutional partners right now with Lumina and other customers within the content technology space. Those announcements will be released by them. I I'm, I have nothing to, to say about that now, but um, once as soon as they release, um, I'll, let, I'll let you guys know and we'll put that information out as well. So those are the ways that we're looking to increase that volume. Uh, let's see. I'm going to other questions. So how will the no fees model sustain based on that? Um, um, and I, I think I just mentioned that earlier. To the degree that you have master nodes accumulating um, LPC, LGS for protecting their respective blockchains, it's the case that you're receiving funds for protecting the network. You can offset those fees that you would typically charge to customers for uh, at point of sale instead of uh, charging a 3% on a transaction because you're getting paid from the master node 
you can offset those fees at the, at the point of sale supported by the master node. At the same time, at the level of the ATM machines, you know, if you, we recommend it's the case that you can have the master node linked to the ATM to A, replenish the cryptocurrency that's available for purchase in the ATM, or B, offset any of the fees as, that you would typically charge your customers for engaging in a transaction um, at, a, at a, that ATM. So, and I know everyone here is probably engaged in the process, going to ATM and then inserting the ATM, uh, a Visa debit uh, or debit card into the ATM, wanting to withdraw your funds and then say, hey, this ATM is going to charge you $5 for the fees. That's a big turnoff. Um, it's a, a mini aggressive, a micro aggressive attack on your sovereignty in terms of making payments over and these little things just like the five dollar fee for a, a withdrawal in some places two dollars here three dollars there your bank account being charged four dollars five dollars in a service fee fifteen dollars in some instances buying a, a money order so all of these things are cumulative in in the sense that it's small you kind of brush it off but cumulatively it's having an impact let's say at at the bank buying a money order paying Fifteen twenty dollars for a bank issued money order—it makes no sense. Doing a wire transfer, paying forty fifty dollars for a wire transfer—it makes absolutely no sense at all. But we're proposing a business model. Perhaps it, it will have some traction. Perhaps we may need to, to modify or make adjustments ourselves on how we execute it. But the initial plan is to have the master node serve as a way in which it it's linked to a wallet that supports the ATM in that the fees or the rewards coming from the master node um, payment actually reserve its services or replenishes the ATM and is able to offset the fees. So, and we'll experiment and we'll be doing some case studies as well in terms of the, the pilot customers um, to whom we send those point of sale devices and those ATMs in January. I know I'm running my mouth all day, but I wanna be able to get some things out, but I, I think it makes sense. Um, I think Colin was mentioning it, that we will have some updates as well. All right. United.com, Dev7, Crypto Afternoon. Who else done a lot in crypto and NASDAQ? Well, I know that's Char sure asking that, 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 that question. We're in a bear, we've been in a bear market since the beginning of, of 2000 and 2018. Um, the, uh, the equities market, when you look at the actually the, the equities just jumping off a cliff this past month, I think that's good for us. There was a recent article that came out that basically says that um, there's relatively no correlation between the crypto market and the equities market. So when you look at NASDAQ, when you look at the Dow, and you look at really all of the things that have propped up the propped up those markets, for instance, uh, the recent tax cuts where the companies are deciding instead of paying wages, paying higher wages to employees or investing in the infrastructure of the business, they're taking that money and they're actually buying their own stock. And what other articles suggest that the CEOs are cashing out on those buybacks. So when those buybacks are happening and the companies are buying their own stock, inflating the price, the CEOs are cashing out. But now we've entered into a... Um, a period whereby companies are not allowed to buy back their stock. As a result, we've seen the market um, take a, a correction. It's now in correction territory. So um, things don't necessarily look on the, the up and up um, when you look at the traditional equities. Um, and I think it looks good for crypto, particularly when you look at where we are in this, this cycle here, uh, where we look, it looks like we're moving out of that um, that bearish trend into more an accumulation trend and after the accumulation trend we'd have some upside moving to the bull market so with that said let me get into some uh, some news about the uh, work with UCF I know that was mentioned earlier um, as well um, I'll, I'll go back to the original article that was published by the University of Central Florida on the work um, that we're doing with them um, the future of cryptocurrency a UCF graduate um, that's me a group of students um, and a first-of-a-kind massive program to help change the way we look at money. So 
I'll, I'll, I'm not going to necessarily focus on the um, the UCF the the UCF psychology program as much. We've had not that many students show interest. We've had like one or two, and, it, and that's periodic interaction, um, uh, being able to do work with with us in the program. Our interaction now with the fintech or a financial technology program that's by the College of Business and College of Engineering and Computer Science. Um, we have um, speaking with Dr. Um, Huanai Honghui Chen or Dr. Chen in the, the business school. We've had several meetings, interactions. As a matter of fact, we're having another meeting with them tomorrow. We, we, we as Exchange, the managing organization for LPC LGS, we have given to the uh, university or, or to the, the business school and the College of Engineering who are jointly developing this program our letter of support um, our partners have given letters of support um, so Luminous provided letter of support um, we've provided our letter of support for the proposal in building out the program which will launch and they have scheduled on in 20 fall of 20 fall of 2020 I believe, but I think with the partners we're bringing in, we could accelerate that accelerate that um, that schedule and that timeline. We're having a meeting tomorrow to actually put that option on the table for them because the professors have to be able to build out the, the program. And that's where we'll get more of our resources, both in the professors who actually are familiar with financial technology and will pe be teaching the students and the students themselves coming from the engineering um, College of Engineering, Computer Science, and the College of Business. Right now, the way the program is structured, the FinTech program, it will really be two levels. The master's program, where you would go through a sequence of courses around financial um, computer science. You're taking your basic comp sci courses. Um, at the same time, you will also be taking some of the, the courses in, say, finance, uh, in finance, in accounting, in investments. Uh, and then being able to move into da aspects of data science and artificial intelligence, because I think that's going to overwhelm or, or enter into the space relatively soon. So, and they're developing a 30 credit hour program for Master of Science. Uh, at the same time, uh, the undergrad program uh, will be a minor in the fin FinTech and not necessarily a full degree program. So if you're coming from computer science and moving into, um, uh, and you want to get that um, minor, you'd have to take some business courses that are aligned to the, the fintech um, fintech minor. If you're coming from the B school, if you're coming from the school school of business, um, you'd have to take some comp sci courses in order, to, like your basic programming, your object oriented design analysis, um, databases, and to begin to understand or be able to have some competency if you're moving into the master's program. So, like I mentioned earlier, tomorrow we'll be having a meeting with the um, a, a meeting with the folks from comps, computer science, the, the College of Business, with our partners. So it will be Exchange, the managing entity of LPC LGS. It will be Lumina, and it will be our our tech partner. I cannot name who they are, um, and I think I mentioned it on the last call. But they want to be a part of this and helping to push the program forward. Um, as well, and I'll, like I said, I mention, I'll mention that partner um, at the conference on um, unless UCF makes some press release about what's what's happening in the space. But for the most part, um, that partner will be on the call, and we have representatives from that organization as well. So um, that's where we are with UCF. We do have some students so far at the Human Human Factors Program who've offered to do some work with us in building out. Um, and refining in the sense because we've already partnered, we already have a POS, um, POS and ATM partner. We have provisions within the, the agreements to make some modifications and adjustments to the intellectual properties, and say in terms of the near field communication aspects of the the point of sale device and the the ATMs, and also some of the the business models. We we are going to, we have some information around you know, sharing and IP. Um, as well. So it's a lot of great things happening in the space with the partners around um, the POS ATM, uh, partners we have with um, in the content technology space and in the, the IT space in general. Um, so it's a lot of synergy coming together um, and that's focused primarily 
on being able to build out infrastructure for the point of sale devices and the ATMs and the education around the students and others coming into the uh, coming into the crypto space. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity um, if we're able to get to get a few machines, um, ATM machines and point of sale devices on campus with the students within that college environment. So going to a, a local restaurant, going to um, say a bookstore and being able to use LPC, LGS, I think will be absolutely great for us. But those are those are not actually on the immediate on our immediate timeline, our goal is to get them into the universities, every university that we're on. And we're in discussions with other talks with other universities at this point. And the goal for us is to have the ATMs there within, say, an, say an incubator or an accelerator or within the, the teaching as a part of the courses. The students have access to the cryptocurrencies to be able to build out their, their projects that they do. Um, but that's those are things that we'll be discussing uh, with. Uh, UCF, the, the FinTech directors, and the ones who are proposing the, the program uh, to be able to build it out. So, and, and just to, to let you know how it works, um, for uh, any degree program, there has to be a proposal coming from the particular school to let them know that there's some demand for the, the, the program, um, how it will be useful, how it relates to jobs that are either already here or jobs that are emerging. So in the case of jobs that are emerging, um, we provided the letter of support, letting them know, hey, this space is growing faster than what you think is already dominating finance, is dominating other industries too. So I think it's, it, it's in the best interest of UCF to take that lead and be able to branch not only into the FinTech program, but also real estate into accounting, um, into government services, um, considering that there's a huge um, DOD arm on the campus um, that we could perhaps make some plays into as well. But with the partners that we have in place now, I think we have a, a pretty good team to, to get into a lot of institutions moving forward. So let me see. Hmm. And I think for the most part, that's it. Wow. It's almost a whole hour. Man, I've been running the whole time. The last thing I wanted to touch on is the, the, the shared master note service. I know, I think it was State Cube got hacked not too long ago um, and there's some individuals who lost in the community who lost funds um, and I think someone like added me in the, the discord in the general channel saying hey guys why don't you all take some some ways take some initiative to the fix this problem so we don't we never ever ever happen it, it never happens to us ever again my my position on that is yes it should be the case where we should have some um, knowledge about a how the hack happened B um, what is the particular exploit um, and C how how we will be proactive in interacting with our um, shared ex shared master notes hosting services so they can keep us in the loop we haven't been kept in the loop in, in terms of what's happened uh, in terms of the hack, there have been um, anecdotal um, reports coming from investors in the community, and the general word is coming from the exchanges is that, hey, it's this particular coin that caused the problem because they're targeting this particular coin or, or forks of a particular coin. All of them are vulnerable. So, A, we haven't received an official notification about the hack coming from state cube or any other um uh, any of the of these master note hosting services in terms of the hack so and one of the things for me is i like to know how the hack happened i know anytime something bad happens in a community people are more likely if they are a part of the hack they're more likely to attribute blame to someone else than to themselves um then, then, and, but I think, in, in my opinion, if I'm an exchange, I'm, uh, I'm an, a hosted service or an exchange that's been hacked, and the hack has happened in the case of a, a shared master node service, I would reach out to recognize, A, where I went wrong, where we went wrong in the process of setting up our infrastructure. Then B, what were the vulnerabilities with a particular wallet sitting within that environment? And I can give you some insights um, from what I know um, based on how some wallets are set up in a, a master node, shared master node service and, and, and 
I can give you the insight that I know, but the other individuals uh, associated with these different master node services, they'd have to clarify their position. Some of these wallets, they're, they're, they're not encrypted because they're, they aren't encrypted, um, and that would involve a process for each and every transaction that's taking place. Um, there would need to be an encrypted password that would need to be provided before transactions can happen in or out. So some of them might be encrypted, some of them uh, aren't encrypted. So that's what I know. So I'm defining it in terms of what I know. Some of them are not encrypted. Those wallets that sit there, they are not encrypted. As a consequence, uh, you do have some vulnerabilities that may take place as a result. So State Cube hasn't reached out to us. I would strongly recommend that they do reach out to us, and I'm saying this in public so you know, um, or any other Masternode or um, Masternode hosting service. If there's a hack that happens on your platform, if uh, and same thing with an exchange, if there's a hack that happens on your exchange, like going back to some of the issues with Cryptopia that we talked about earlier in terms of funds being lost and tracking and tracing transactions on the blockchain and saying, hey guys, um, this actually was not uh, a transaction that was sent for me and I'm showing information, uh, support being totally oblivious, not responding to the requests or calls. At the same time, you have to communicate. That's the only way that we're going to survive in this game at the end of the day and not necessarily fight each other. So that's the point that I'll make. If there's an exchange or, or a hosting service that had some issue or some hack or have a particular concern with our coin, um, A, Rick, please explain to us how it happened. B, how, A, how the hack happened within your exchange. Then you have some clarity yourself in communicating to us because it's publicly known. At the same time, if there are vulnerabilities within the particular wallet, could you tell us the specifications under which you deployed that particular wallet in your environment? So if if the vulnerabilities exist to such a degree where we're constantly we're constantly under attack and having funds being stolen, why isn't it the case that individual project owners or individual owners of our wallets on their desktops, they haven't been hacked? Um, yet, so I'm, I'm I'm looking at things, particularly if the case you have the wallet encrypted. So those are the things that I like to know. If we have vulnerabilities that are a consequence of, of, of a fork of a particular coin, um, we like to know those vulnerabilities. At the same time, tell us about how the incident happened. Um, considering my my background in, in government and investigations, I I really want to trace the path from beginning to end. So that's what I'll state. But for the most part, um, I, I look forward to collaborating with with more, um, ex more exchanges, more um, hosting services to the degree that the security is tight and they're able to disclose to us that they have measures in place for reporting vulnerabilities, not only in um, our vulnerabilities, not only within our project. And if you can name those specifically, I'd be more than willing to hear the conversation, actually have our IT security guy um, actually on the, the line, and, and we can take move, take the conversation from there. And if you guys have launched, we've launched in a, in a master node hosting service, we can send our IT security guy to go, um, say, white hat and conduct some activities on your particular um, hosting service. Actually, we have, in my opinion, we have one of the best um, IT security guys in in the crypto space, he's actually found vulnerabilities in a variety of different coins, and even in some of the top organizations like Oracle, he's found vulnerabilities, and he's getting credit, um, giving us some credibility in this space in terms of what we do. So those are the things that we're looking to um, open up on, being have being more open and disclosing when things happen, telling people what those vulnerabilities are if there's a particular exchange that's been hacked or had some issue had, communicate with us talk directly. I'm available on Twitter. I'm available on LinkedIn. I'm available on the Discord channel. Um, send me a message and we can go from there. But with that said, guys, um, I think with the, prog the progress that we're making in, in the space in terms of our partnerships, in terms of our um, progressing on our roadmap, being able to display our ATMs point of sale devices in December, also being able to re reveal um, our largest tech partner to date um, moving forward in this space. Um, it's, it's on the up and up. So, um, let me know. You can leave some questions in the comment section. Uh, give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Um, I know some of you don't have an issue giving a thumbs down. 
Uh, but at the at the same time, um, this is how we get better at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, we're I'm not looking to, to either cause some friction in the cryptocurrency space because we need we all need each other to survive. And I think we have to find a common ground on, on which we can proceed. And with that said, leave the comments down and, and let me know. Um, I've enjoyed the this talk today. Okay, I'm going to end this here. Uh,